Good morning everyone, good afternoon, good evening, good wherever you are. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show. This is episode number 150. I have no idea to say it in Spanish, so I'm going to say the numbers individually. Uno cinco zero. Welcome back. Another episode of the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How are you doing? How are you feeling, motherfuckers? Hope you're well, well rested, well hydrated and all that malarkey. I've got up quite early this morning. Um, I came back from a little run. I came back in. As you can see, I'm fully dressed because I got a head straight back out to work. But I thought, you know what? Because I'm um, uh, I'm a stickler for um, consistency, right? And I'm, it's a new year. I want to have some new habits. So I'm going to consistently put out free podcasts, a minimum, right? This week or, or each week that I'm alive. And if I can ramp up to five, <gasps> that will be amazing. So yeah, in an effort to make sure I'm consistent and keep on, on track of what I wanted to do and my plan for the week, I'm uploading now quickly before I head out to work. Hope you guys are well, hope you guys are well rested, well hydrated, all that malarkey. Um, my uh, my limbs are fairly um, well rested. Um, I still My legs are still aching. It seems like just when I think I've got the hang of running again, just when I think I've got the hang of getting back into that rhythm of continually putting myself under cardiovascular strain, I wake up in the morning and my body reminds me, <laughs> ah, you think you had it? You thought you had it, you stupid, stupid boy. And then I'm right back down to earth. And here I am now walking around my flat um, before I'm about to head out and walk to the station get on the underground walk to work and my feet are fucking killing me i'm just i'm dreading i'm dreading this walk to the station i'm dreading my walk to work i'm dreading my walk around i'm dreading everything um which is fucking interesting to say the least isn't it just when you think you have it just when you think you've got it in your grasp of your hands someone slaps it out of you but anyway um that's essentially where i am body composition wise um diet has been going pretty well i've been fasting 16 hours a day for the most part um eating a fairly slow carb if not um completely carb free diet consisting of eggs uh spinach um with spring onions um a couple of frankfurters on the side if i'm feeling a little bit cheeky and then for lunch i might have a big salad and some chicken i bought um roasted chicken i just cut up into different little pieces and chuck them into my tupperware box and that's my lunch for the most part and then i have a banana as a snack later on or, or an orange and then i basically fast from about 4 p.m 3 30 sometimes depending on when i take my lunch and that's the last time i have basically um my food I like to think of it as a um, eating restriction window as opposed to a fasting window. Um, I try just to eat within a certain amount of time because I just find, you know, especially after work, you know, you may, you don't make good decisions after work. You're on your way back home. You're walking past the station. You want to pop into M&S and then you're buying a fucking sandwich. And then by the time you finish the sandwich, you want to buy a crisp pack of crisp. Like that food is never nutritious enough. It's never filling enough uh, to satisfy just that one bite or that one hit. It's all like when you go to McDonald's, right? Rarely does anyone go to McDonald's just get a meal, uh, right? Like in this adult age, when's the last time you went to McDonald's and just bought a meal? That's just that, just a Big Mac meal, nothing else extra. You always buy like a little something extra on top, whether it's a double cheeseburger, a chicken wrap, this, nuggets, cheese bites, uh, fucking, um, what the little chicken tender things they have. You're always buying little tiny extra things and I kind of find buying lunch outside of work the same sort of thing. Whenever you go to buy a sandwich at prep, for me personally, I don't know about anyone else, maybe I'm I'm just a fat cunt inside, but um, whenever I go to somewhere like prep, I'm always like, you know, tempted to pick up a fucking fudge brownie or some peanuts or some shit, right? I'm always buying extra little bits or I might go and get one of those um, cauliflower lasagna things. Uh, is it broccoli lasagna? I think broccoli lasagna. They're fucking so tasty. <laughs> Actually, the thought of it's making me hungry. I'm going to stop talking about that. Anyway, um, so yeah, I've been fairly clean, fairly good eating wise, just um, making sure that i'm training at the same level as well to keep up that kind of consistency um it has to be that, that level in order for me to get, get to my goals as quickly as i can um and also you know race season's coming up i've got a few races planned that i want to get on with so i don't need to waste any time and i need to need to need to drop the pounds um as soon as i can in order to make sure that i'm ready for race day because unfortunately running is maybe one of those only things that you know you can't necessarily do regardless of your size or you know you can't do well regardless of your size you can run of course you know i'm pretty sure everyone's seen images of people running um 5ks 10ks half marathons with a sort of malarkey and they've you know all shapes and sizes it's quite inspiring but in terms of um longevity um in terms of just performance it's probably it's probably optimal for you to kind of try and be as fit as you can in order to run races because you know just it's just science isn't it really you know running 
running on tarmac or running on the wherever you were running cross country even carrying you know 20 pounds or 30 pounds extra excess in weight is just putting you at a disadvantage when it comes to trying to you know beat your times or trying to maintain a particular kind of pace or even preventing injuries right because when you get fatigued is when you get injured really you get fatigued you lose your form um, you end up doing something stupid, you pull something, you drag when you're not meant to drag, or whatever you do, you stumble, you stack, and then you end up falling over. And um, that is not something that I want to do, especially with my big ass self. Anyways, we're here, another episode. Thanks for tuning in. Funny things happened in the last few weeks, actually. The last episode I recorded a couple of weeks ago, where I outed the company I used to work for, who kind of, you know, did me wrong, um, had them, haven't paid us our salaries, have now uh, decided to get in touch via email and write a fairly lengthy email which kind of I didn't address any of the points that I kind of brought up in my video uh, and they and that's all um, narcissistic um, self-centered companies are they only saw the wrongs that I was doing if supposedly I was in the wrong supposedly I was jeopardizing other people's case and position supposedly I was um, at fault for many things in this company's eyes so um, they decided to play the victim in the email write me a long soliloquy about why maybe I should stop doing the things that I'm doing which is interesting right because you know some of these companies um, that you know treat their companies treat their employees like shit they only do so because they can hide behind this um uh weird kind of agree this weird cloak right of professionalism where if you're the employee you don't necessarily want to you know ruffle feathers you don't want to look unprofessional you don't want to do anything out of turn or out of character right don't want to speak out the side of your mouth per se and they use that to their advantage because for the most part they can do you wrong right they can not pay you they can probably not give you that promotion they promise they're going to give you or promise they're going to give you the opportunity to get the promotion they can do many things to kind of, you know, make you feel as if you're not um, um, valued or, or you're not respected in the workplace. But the moment you try to shame them in public is the moment they come at you with all guns blazing. And why they do that? Because by and large, people don't do it because they don't, they don't want to suffer the wrath of a company. Well, I like to say this publicly. I'm not scared of anyone, right? I'm not scared of any of these motherfuckers, right? I think for the most part, I respect those who give respect. You give me respect, you show me that you're a good person, you show me you're doing good work, you treat others with respect as well. That's the kind of person I am. I'm not even that bothered about whether or not you show me respect. Show show me that you treat others with people with respect, especially the ones who work underneath you. And, or even or even better yet, your customers. Let me see how you treat your customers. Let me go on Glassdoor and read the reviews, even though Glassdoor can be a bit crazy. Let me go on your Facebook page and read the comments left by people that review your app or your service. Let me see what the customers think about you. Let me Google your name on Twitter. Let me Google your name on Instagram. Let me see what people say or search your name on Instagram, whatever it may be. Let me see what people say about you. And then we can start this talking about respect. But, you know, to try and bully an, an employee. I don't even work for you anymore, right? So imagine that. We, don't even, we technically don't work for you anymore and you're trying to bully an employee is is um is quite laughable to be honest it's really really laughable but um again i will not be bullied that's not a vocabulary that even exists in my in my um in my uh arsenal of words um that's not something i acknowledge or anything so that malarkey but in an effort to kind of keep peace in the middle east and to ensure everyone gets a fair crack at in receiving the uh, the money that they're owed i will cease from doing any sort of um post anymore regarding that situation and kind of keep that to myself uh but the moment i feel like they're taking the piss the moment i feel like um you know you know um the moment i feel like they are not acknowledging what's going on i will again raise my hand and say my piece that is especially what i'm going to do because like, again these places like i mentioned a few times i think um after listening to uh, Jason Fried, he wrote a book called uh, It Doesn't Have To Be Crazy At Work, which I've recommended a few times to a few people. Um, you can get an audio book. It's a fairly quick audio book to read. It's even better reading it on your tablet. It's a very, it's very, it's quite, it's not like, um, it's kind of written like a pamphlet. So a really nice little short little bits, little, little um, segments of advice, nice cool illustrations. You can get through it in a day if you want to. It's a really cool book. I recommend you check it out. But Jason Fried is one of the co-founders of Basecamp, and he basically writes this book as like an uh, um, it's like an antidote to the chaos you might see in startups, right? Or in companies that are trying to implement a startup culture. So all that stuff about flat hierarchy, all that stuff about 
uh, massages at work, uh, foosball tables, company outings, all that stuff designed to keep you at work, just to keep you kind of on the fucking treadmill. He kind of works against it and kind of wants to have a workplace that's peaceful, a workplace where people get to do their work uninterrupted. So he doesn't, he doesn't have, they don't have Slack in their office. Imagine no Slack, no messaging service, which is fucking my heaven. Um, you know, no Slack. If you don't talk to somebody, you got to talk to them in person. If you want to request a meeting, you have to ask them first. You have time on their schedule. You can't, you don't just have access to their calendar. You know, sometimes when you work in a workplace and you might want to have a meeting with your manager, they'll be like, oh, just, uh, check my calendar and you can just insert yourself in their, in their calendar sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad because of course the manager then doesn't get to do any work because he or she's always interrupted by things right because usually you know the more senior you are in these, in these companies the more you're having to kind of like put out fires for the most part you're not actually doing any sort of work you're not actually leading the team you're not setting a mandate you're not kind of driving them forward um so he fights against all that and he's got a really good book that kind of um just talks about you know the workplace drama and what's kind of happening on startups and i think um by and large i think that book what it again reminded me of is my you know my impression or my idea is that for most people right working regardless if it's working on startup or corporation most people would rather not do it right most people would rather not do that work right but part of the reason why you want to work is because especially as an adult especially in work living in a big metropolitan city like the uh, like london it's quite rare you get to meet new people right new interesting people that you might develop friendships with and work in kind of a weird way has kind of supplemented that it's kind of acted like as um a replacement for colleges and universities right a replacement for maybe your low ranking in your social group right you can then start a job in a new place and all of a sudden you've got a new social group of people to hang out with man now it might be service level it might be the kind of workplace where as soon as you leave no one's called you anymore right or all those kind of things but at least for the time you're there you have friends <laughs> And I think that's worth it. That's worth it to have a job alone, right? But the moment people start, the moment the company themselves starts taking themselves, start to take themselves too seriously, the moment they want you to justify your existence, the moment they want you to act like an entrepreneur for a company you work for, is the moment that I kind of I I tap out. I tap out. I tap out. Because for the most part, we all want these jobs to keep a roof over our head, keep us fed. Right, keep us and kind of you know do do the stuff we want to do outside of work. We don't go to these jobs to find fulfillment. We don't find go to jobs to find um uh, blah, 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 to find a reason to exist. Right, they don't they're not going to fill a hole in our heart. We go there in order to kind of exchange our time for money, and they do the same thing for us. So the moment they kind of overstep their mark and try and think they're bigger than what they are is the moment most employees kind of like clock out. And especially, added to the top of that, especially when you work for a company and the basic things that they need to do for you, right? Provide you with a safe area for you to work and also pay you on time. If they don't pay you on time, then all bets are off. There is no, um, there is no reason. There is no, um, you know, there is no, um, there is no debating left anymore. When you don't pay somebody on time, automatically it's over. When you don't allow people to go on holidays and take breaks from work, automatically it's over. When you require people to work uh, two hours a day extra all the time because you want to give them the false hope that if they do that, they're going to get uh, a big opportunity in the end, over. That's not how it should be. There's eight hours a day. There is enough time for you to get your work done, impress who you need to impress, collaborate with who you need to collaborate with, um, be creative. You can do all that in eight hours. You don't need an extra two hours. You don't need an extra three hours. Unless you want to do it yourself, that's all well and good. More power to you. But when a company is enforcing this kind of culture that that kind of makes you, that thinks that they're rewarding people who stay longer, who lick more ass, who are always at the meeting, who are taking notes, all that sort of stuff. That's when suddenly it starts to venture into this other land, startup land, where, you know, employees are not necessarily employees. They, I don't know, they kind of like live in help, which I've never been a fan of in general. Um, so anyway, with that being said, that kind of stuff is over on my part. I won't say anything more regarding that situation unless they step out of line and do some other bullshit. So, um, again, just a warning to everybody else, um, most companies, most startups, um, I'm a decent dude, man. Like I want to do good work. I, I think I can add a lot to most companies as I've done. So in the most part of my career, but I also think, you know, I, I like everyone else deserves respect, right? You deserve respect. And there are many, there are kind of like some basic general uh, benchmarks or obligations or things that companies should do for you without me having to make a video and go all crazy um, that should be met, you know, providing a safe area to work, uh, knowing where, you know, your responsibilities lie and what your role is and paying the person on time. That's all we want. Anything else on top of that, massages, snooker tables, foosball, company outings, that's all auxiliary, that's all extra, that's all bonuses on top. That's a cherry on top of the cake. 
the basics of those jobs, those free fundamentals are what we want. Safe place to work, uh, a role that is fulfilling in some respects. So, you know, you feel like you can do great work at that place, you know, responsibilities on your boundaries are and get paid on time. That's all we want. Anything else on top of that is surface level things to just, I mean, there's extra layers on the cake that's just to hide the, the shittiness of it. It's the only, you know those cakes, right? Those horrible um, sponge cakes that aren't really tasty, but then they cover with the fucking icing and they don't taste of anything. We don't want that. Give us a nice cake. I don't know who makes good cakes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on to the podcast. Let's go because there's so much to talk about and I got to get out of here. So, um, number one, number one, number one, number one, number one, number one, number one. Wireless Festival lineup has been announced. Wireless Festival 2019 is coming. Um, I don't know why I'm doing that. I'm just doing that to get hyped because I, I never go. Never been to Wireless Festival. It was meant to go la- a couple of years ago, but didn't end up going. Um, my brothers have been a couple of times and they fucking loved it. But my brothers are in that perfect age range for Wireless Festival. They're between 21 and 26. Or, yeah, let's say, no, let's say 19 and 26. They're in a perfect age bracket to enjoy wireless, right? They have enough of a, uh, a they have enough of a repertoire knowledge base of music in order to deem what's good or not. Um, they like what they like based on their age and um, all of their groups all of their social groups their friends whatever go there or wish they could be there for for those kids wireless is probably like their coachella for the most part it really is it's like the biggest thing for them they were talking about it for after the festival it's like when i went to la i kind of remember i was um, annoying the brunette and a few of my friends because i was talking about la like for like i don't know maybe three months after i went right because it was such an amazing experience when i went to see golf i went to, see, went to golf wang festival went to go to the laugh factory i saw crystal leah perform i saw whitney um i saw sorry i saw tiffany haddish before she was a star all that sort of shit right so i went to i went i went to the um, uh rainbow cafe um and bumped into a few celebrities there like you know like um they they see it as a big, as a big, 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 big social occasion in their calendar. So I'm sure my brothers have probably bought a ticket already. For them, it's a big, big deal. And I guess for us oldies, it's also a bigger deal too because it's probably the only time we're going to get to see that kind of range of artists, especially hip hop wise, urban wise, whatever you may deem them to be, all in one arena, all in one place. Right? It's just quite rare to see them people all together in one place because for the most part, some of these American artists, especially the bigger ones, don't tour in Europe or no, don't come to London that often. Or when they do, it's part of like a big tour that usually sells out quite quickly. So you get the chance to see loads of a variety of hip hop acts all in one time during a you know during a weekend. Um, in a park that's you know fairly close to most people that live in in that live in London. Um, of course, over the years it's got really really popular, maybe because of the Drake effect a couple of years ago. But I've seen these certain years or the previous years it's starting to sell out really quickly, and that means that not only is it getting popular, but also the scary thing is that the kids between nineteen and twenty six are now getting wise to festival calendars, right? And are now getting wise to saving up money beforehand because that's part of the process of when. Like when I used to go to stuff like um download festival, where used to go to stuff like um what's that festival I used to go to? Anyway, a few other love box and stuff, whatever. When it wasn't cool within the let's say the black community for the most part, um you would hear people say, "Oh, why are you going to that white people shit? Why are you going to these festivals?" Da, 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 right? It will kind of be um you know they'll kind of you know pull their nose up at it. Then especially you told them the price, right? The price of tickets has always been high, like 100 quid, 120 quid. Like, what the fuck? That's mad. Why do you go to that festival? Da, 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 da. It never kind of got into the buying culture of like, let's go to the festival, the benefits of it. They never really got it. And, you know, for most, I think, people from the ends, when they hear festival, they think of like, you know, Glastonbury and best of one people in the mud and shit and camping and pissing and not fucking showering for three days. That's what most people in the ends think of. But of course, as time has progressed and festivals have got a bit more um, polished, a little bit more refined, people are now seeing that festivals are more than just that, right? They're not just like camping in the woods somewhere. They can just be like a festival can just be something that happens um, during the day, closes at night, starts again in the morning, closes at night, right? You don't have to stay there. It's kind of going to be a, like like Coachella, basically, in, in that respect. Um, there's a difference between a Coachella and a Burning Man, right? They're, they're kind of two different experiences. So now because of that, I've seen a, there's a difference in buying culture because this means that, or buying habits or pros, or, or prospecting what you want to do in the summer, this means that per, people from the ends are deciding what they want to do for summer, holidays, whatever they want to do, because even, I've seen, it's quite popular, especially my, because my brother's always the, kind of the, the way I tap into what's happening in the black community. And I've seen a lot of um, 
um, companies that they kind of follow on Instagram that do these package holiday deals where they go to like, um, I think it's Lisbon. I think they might go to Ibiza, a few other places in Spain. These package holidays where they, they take kids basically from ends or people from, you know, the community. So, so they take them sometimes on a boat. Sometimes they take them on holiday package deal and they do the whole kind of like island hopping, island tour things, you know, um, whatever young people get up to in those kind of islands. And um, that is, again, uh, kind of the evolution of the buying culture, right? People understanding now there might be quite a lot of value in it as fucking, you know, awful as it may seem on paper, it might be quite fun, right? To link up with everyone from all different ends, all different areas of London, meet new girls, meet new guys if you're into guys. Like, it might be quite a cool experience to hang out with. You get go in the sun for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or for a weekend. Usually, packet deals are quite... Our price quite well, you know, it's quite a bit of a bargain. It probably includes your flights, your accommodation, your transport and stuff. Just bring spending money extra on top of it. Um, and um, the sellout of this wireless festival has shown again that really people are hip to um, how um, beneficial it is or cost effective to go to a festival. But of course, the lineup is what really sells wireless. And this year's lineup is probably, you know, as good as any ones they've done previously. I've got it here on the screen. Let me get up here, guys, and see it. So. This year's lineup on uh oh no that's not that that's that's something else that's um that's rolling loud let me get the other one up wireless festival lineup here we go so this lineup of West by Westfield was probably as good or even better than the ones they've had previously to be honest um very good range of artists so um let's get it up on here boom so for Friday. They have Cardi B Amigos, who come probably as a package deal, right? Which is interesting to see, right? Because, you know, I bet you, um, I bet, the, what's his name? I bet QC, um, of the um, the quality control guys, I bet they're super happy that they're, what you call it, offsetting thing back together, right? Because if they come as a package deal and you have to book them for these events and they weren't together, it would be so awkward every single time they go on festival. So that's cool. Um, you got Tory Lanez and um lma lma had a big year last year the album booed up obviously took over the charts freddo's been on fire since he's come out of prison tiger also dropped a couple of big hits he's getting a little bit played out because he seems to try to always trying to re reproduce taste but you know that's tiger man he, he occupies a certain spot within hip-hop right and whether he does Whether he does well, he does it really well. Whether that is, I don't know how to define it, but he does it quite well. Bugs Malone also had quite a big year. Lil Skies, I'm not too familiar with, and I'm not sure if that many people in the UK know who he is, but I'm sure they book these people based on algorithms and metrics on who listens to what. So I'm sure there might be a few people that listen to Lil, Lil Skies, Lil Skies. Um, I am DDB. She's really popular too. A lot of girls like her. I've not listened to a lot of her music. Um, Heady One, I'm familiar with, and I like a lot too. NSG, I've been blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. Whenever I play out, usually I always get that's the one request I get quite a lot. Have you got NSG? Have you got NSG? Have you got NSG? That's quite good. Malik Berry will be awesome as per usual. Always a good by performer. B Young, I think, has been on here a couple times in a row now, which is quite a good um, I know, acknowledgement of how good of a live show he must put on in general. Um, so he's a performer again on Friday and they got Yinka, who I'm not familiar with, and Tim Westwood DJing. So that's a stellar lineup on Friday. Then on Saturday, right, to make even, even more fucking FOMO of this, Saturday they've got Travis Scott, Future. They've got Lou Uziver and Young Fug, Juice World and Steph London, Trippy Red and Sheck West, M Honcho and Sweetie, um, Unknown T and Ambush, uh, Still Bangers and Cadet, Digger T, <laughs> uh, sorry, um, Dig That and Denzel Driz, and DJ Sim Tex and, and Westwood. Oh my God. And then Sunday, 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 ASAP Rocky, Ray Schmurder, AJ Tracy, Little Baby, Gunner, Notes, Rich the Kid, Ski Master, Slump God, There's all Curry, D Block Europe, um, Jid, Lowski, Russ. Floyo, I'm not sure that is. Lady San Sanity, I'm not sure that is. Manny No, obviously, big DJ and Tim Westwood. Absolutely insane lineup. Absolutely insane. And again, like I mentioned, like I don't have tickets. Tickets are probably always I probably sold out anyway for this thing. So, you know, there's no point even um worrying about if I have tickets or not. But how bad of a lineup that is? How good of a lineup? Sorry, how bad? How good of a lineup do you think that is? Huh? How good a lineup do you think that is? I think it's insane. Absolutely insane. But one thing I was thinking about actually was that if you're a UK artist and this, you know, festival's happening in the UK, it's going to be, a th where is it? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Finsbury Park, right? Um, would you be a little bit bummed out um, with the amount of US-centric guests they have on the lineup? 
Especially considering some of the guests. Um, again, this is only because of the poster. I don't give a shit about these kind of things, but I know artists do care. You see the whole controversy that happened recently with uh, Blueface and Rowdy Rich, right? Uh, they were meant to perform at some gig somewhere in America. I think Blueface's name was a bit smaller than Rowdy Rich's. Rowdy Rich looked like a headliner. Um, uh, uh, Blueface was like a supporting. Of course, Blueface, in his defense, probably thinks he's had the he's more relevant than Rowdy Rich. Even though Rowdy Rich is super, really talented too, and someone a lot of people are have high hopes for. And he kind of backed out of the whole concert because he didn't feel like he was getting the respect he wanted on the flyer, on the poster. So I'm sure publicists, agents, whoever they are, managers who do all that thing are very. Um, finicky about where their artists are on the list and how small their text is compared to everyone else. Um, and you saw a little bit of that in the Fire Documentary Festival, right? And the Fire Festival documentary where the kids like kind of stressing over um, over the font size of a certain artist that's featured on the lineup. But I'm wondering if it's a UK based festival, London based for the most part, you know, UK music has been um, popping up this last few years. Um, a lot of the kids, especially my little brothers, they don't listen to any UK US music, if not that much at all. Maybe my youngest brother does a little bit. Some some Tyler the Creator, some ASAP Rocky and shit, but for the most part, they only listen to UK music, only, only UK music. So, um, a lot of the youth, like, that's what they listen to on their iPods or their players or whatever they're using their phones with, right? Um, so would you be a little bit annoyed that it's quite US heavy? And is there, um, is there, is there, a, what is there like, um, would it be possible to have a festival that was similar to this that just focused on promoting UK acts? Whether they be hip hop, whether they, you know, because I'm sure there's loads of good bands we have, loads of good, like, kind of roots style band, like jazzy type bands. I'm sure there's loads of really cool girls doing, like, really interesting versions of pop, right? It's similar to, like, Mabel and shit like that. There must be a lot of people out there who are doing that kind of stuff who could be featured on a stage and it might be a good look for everyone, right? Imagine having notes and then the Chino's guys headlining these shows, right? And then maybe bringing through a few Afrobeat guys over. Maybe they cost too much, whatever. But is there a reason for it? Or maybe bring over some guys from Europe, right? Some of the French dudes and all that malarkey. Like, it might. Is there a reason for it? I think there might be, you know, because as great as Wireless is, looking at the lineup, it just looks like, um, you know, our version of of Rolling Loud, um, which is interesting too, because I've heard rumors that Rolling Loud they might start doing, they might um create a Rolling Loud in London. That's what I've heard. I've heard rumors of they wanting to create partner up with somebody and do a rolling line in London because they've got you know they've got LA, Miami, where else they've got it? Is it Florida? Right, they have got Florida. They got somewhere else. So I've heard they might want to do a rolling loud um, London. And of course, if you're not familiar with rolling loud, um, for the most part, their lineups are you know solely US based and they're kind of you know well known for promoting SoundCloud um, hip hop artists, right? Or hip hop artists for the most part. Um, and kind of like they, they're really for, or really most popular for reacting really quickly if somebody's hot on the internet you know you get booked on that stage really really fast so there might be a there might be a rationale for having there might be an idea for having something of that ilk in the UK maybe not so leaning to hip-hop because maybe you know there might be like I said there might be more music out there than just hip-hop like someone like a, a Bakar um, I'm I'm thinking of who's quite popular in the UK um, he should maybe be headlining a festival or doing something of that kind of ilk that would be quite cool to see um, but you don't really see it because again you know they're concentrating mostly on that um, you know I, I don't know I don't know I'm of that thinking I'd love to see gigs headlining a festival you know not being you know the second act on a thing like that could be so super cool interesting to see but I don't know <laughs> What do I know? Um, again, talking about Rolling Loud, they also have announced their lineup, which I briefly um, showed here on the screen. Let me get up on here. And, you know, it's as good as it's always been, to be honest. It's no surprise here with Rolling Loud. Uh, let me get up on here. So, Rolling Loud Festival, what do they have here? Ah, so, Rolling Loud is taking place in Miami, um, May 10th to, to 10th to 12th. With festivals, as I'm say, you have to be really on it right i think i've told people before and i've done it myself now coming up to primavera festival maybe number three this year and a few other things maybe going to that you really have to be on it with them saving money you really have to start in january if not december with your whatever money you get for christmas whatever it may be and start saving money now so that when you buy tickets and buy flights all you need to do after that is get the combination of your spending money you can kind of get it out of the way like three two months in advance because festivals come really quick January has felt like a month that has never ended, right? It's still going on. Um, we've got a couple more days until January finally ends. But for the most part, festivals are happening within the first, maybe let's say six months of the six months of the year. And they come around super quickly. May, so this is starting in May already. So from April, you're going to see some alternative festivals popping up. Um, you've already got the Berlin um, CTM Festival, the Techno Festival that's really popular. That's starting up on the 29th. 
So you have to kind of be on the ball with your money, with your savings beforehand to kind of get on board with it. Because I've realized at the moment you started to be marked before, like I did it in a few other ones previously. I think I did it to, I did it to Lovebox. I had to pay like, you know, a hundred quid to go, to go one day in Lovebox and then another hundred quid there. Do you know what I mean? I paid it all out of pocket from the money that I had for that month to spend, which again, isn't the best thing to do. You have to really budget these things properly ahead of time. And it makes it so much easier. And in theory, if you want to, if you do it ahead of time, you can potentially go to three or four festivals in one summer easily. Again, you have to maybe cut other things out if you're working full-time. You have to kind of maybe make sure you get holidays in previous um, quite early. But you can do it if you want to. It's not that hard to do. Um, anyway, so the the Rolling Loud Festival um, kicks off. And it's not even called Festival, is it? It's just called Rolling Loud. They don't even call it Festival or anything. Anyway, so Miami Gardens, 10th to 12th of May. Um, on the Friday, 10th, you've got Migos headlining. Saturday, you've got Travis Scott. And Sunday is Kid Cudi. Uh, Friday, um, other guests include Cardi B, Ray Schmurder, Rick Ross, which would be sick. Because um, because I think people are saying that he might release a new album this year, which is going to be amazing. I've been listening to a lot of old Rick Ross recently too. Like, just, you know, again, like, he's always been one of my favorite rappers anyway, in general. I always think he's probably one of the, the best um I don't know, rappers, or, as in well-rounded, him and probably Two Chains as if like on the current scene at the moment in terms of kind of like what they can do, right? They can jump on kind of most beats and um, the substance of what they say, the fact that they're not from the East Coast, West Coast thing, you know, the, the dynamic, um, their background, the longevity of their careers. Like I've always been a fan of Rick Ross. Uh, YG, Juice World, Little Yatty, Trippy Red, Rich the Kid, A Boogie, Smoke Perp, PNB Rock. Who maybe I'm not performing because they didn't get arrested recently for something, right? Um, carrying drugs or some shit, something really heavy. Um, Gold Link would be cool too. Um, he's had a he's had a couple of great songs come out in the last few few months. A few other people, blah blah blah. Uh, Travis Scott, um, headlining on Saturday, and you've got Lil Wayne, Twenty One Savage, Kodak Black, Young Fug, Lil Baby, Gunner, Check West, Jid, Soldier Boy performing on a Saturday, which goes to show, right? For everyone that's poo pooing variety. For everyone that says this thing is worthless and it cheapens your product, eh, not really, really, does it nowadays? Um, I think in the, you know, with journalism dying, you know, you heard of BuzzFeed laying off loads of people, loads of online, lo loads of other online publications getting let go of people. Most of these businesses have kind of um, molded themselves around a model where they have to um, jump onto the next viral story as soon as possible and hope that garners clicks, right? The hope is that you take one soldier interview, you, you, you feature it, then you break up into little bits, you carry on the memes, he doesn't another one you can take that again for another six days he's like a he's like a living content generation machine for all these companies so as cringy and as annoying as it may be it works and the benefit for soldier by himself personally as an artist he probably wouldn't get books for rolling loud if he didn't do the whole rant on breakfast club the other day if he didn't go after tiger drake right and have that whole um, monologue about um kanye making shitty tennis shoes he wouldn't have got booked for rolling loud that's something that we can just Admit, face to face now, right? Mic to mic, ear to ear, right? Like he would not got a book to have sold uh, on Royal Loud if he didn't do the, the thing he had done. So again, it's kind of taking the six nine approach, right? And but using it smartly, not going, not associating with like you know known felons and fucking you know drug lord and gang members and shit people that are really really about that life right maybe not taking it that far but taking that kind of you know idea of being a viral hit creating sketches online being a walking living meme and then help, hoping to use that to kind of leverage your position and give you an opportunity to kind of uh, gain new audiences go on stages you know, and up to be on blah blah, blah 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 because eventually if soldier boy goes on fallon if he goes on jimmy kemmel if he does ellen if he goes on this rolling loud if he's on fucking hot 97 if he does summer jam if he does a um, powerhouse, it's a win. It's a win for him. If you, it's just a fucking win. He's won already. Um, young Nudie Space Coast Perp. I love McConan is back in. It back in trend. It seems like. Um, he kind of ducked out a few times. Um, maybe on purpose because he was. Oh, I just saw him notice too. Blueface is performing. Awesome. Um, that's that's a good look for him as well. Uh, Bones is back. I'm not seeing him perform in a long, long time. Uh, heard anything from him? Uh, Kid Cudi, Lil Uzi Vert, Lil Pump, um, Playboy Carti. Lil Uzi Vert is an interesting one, isn't it? Because it seems like he seems like he's being held hostage by his label. He, he's wanting to be he wanted to be out of that whole DJ drama and canon situation. They obviously don't want to let him go because he's an amazing cash cow. There's obviously something. Um, that we're not hearing in the story. Maybe Lil Uzi Vert isn't the most professional of artists out there. Maybe um, he feels as if he's being held back. But there is something going on there where we're not necessarily getting the whole truth and we haven't really heard anything new from Lil Uzi Vert for a long, long, long time. Um, 
And it's quite annoying because obviously he's supremely talented, isn't it? Right. And he's not necessarily getting the opportunity that he needs to get to kind of showcase that. And he's because of that, he's that's why if you ever noticed why is Lucy Uzibert touring all the time and he's always doing a show because he effectively isn't putting out music. He's only getting money from shows for the most part. Right. Or only money from shows, let's say, quote unquote. Um, Lil Pump, Lil Playboy Carti. Lil Pump is going to be good too because... Um, um, college um what's that uh college dropout or whatever it's called harvard dropout is coming out isn't it soon as well so that'd be cool to see him perform those new songs um uh gucci main tiger kevin gates Lil skies again dmx is performing which would be interesting because the video there was a picture of him coming out of prison that everyone looked ha everyone was happy about him and his kid and his fiance and there was another video of him kind of wilding out at some guys in the hallway somewhere that Anyway, I'm hoping it's not going to be um, crazy um, with him. Wiz Khalifa and Crunchy are performing in 2009, which would be sick. There's a group called Beast Coast, uh, not not to be um, confused with Best Coast, uh, the <laughs> um, that amazing band where I saw in, I saw in Coco a long time ago, um, featuring Joey Ballard, that's some Flatfoot Zombie, which is kind of a super group. Loads of people are doing this sort of thing now. You saw um, Gucci Mane, uh, Little Pump, and somebody else. Who is it? They're going to be called the Glacier Boys, right? Or something like that, right? Or something along those... Or Gucci Gang. Well, that's Gucci Gang, right? I think um, Gucci Mane, um, Lil Pump, and maybe Smoke Perp. I think they're, they're the ones performing. So I've seen a lot of this happening. Like these kind of like, you know, um, new boy bands uh, for the for the, for the sake of it. Skimmer's Slum Card is always kind of like a, a staple there. And Young Boy Never Broke It Again is going to be awesome. Y YBM. YMBA, 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 one of my favorites, one you know, supremely talented hit um artist, but you know, it doesn't he's a little bit little bit reckless. Um but yeah, that lineup seems amazing. Of course, um always cool, rolling loud, and again, like I said, I heard a rumor they're gonna come over to London, and if they do, I cannot wait. Anyways, um what else is happening? Oh, um All Points East, another festival that I wanted to quickly mention. Um I think I heard about this from a mate that went last year. It got a pretty good write-up in Resident Advisor 2. I think Resident Advisor featured it and said it was a really good festival for the most part. Let me see if I can quickly get it up on here. Um, a fest I think it's in Victoria. Is it in Victoria Park? Yeah, Victoria Park. Um, All Points East. Fairly indie um, lineup for the most part of it with a few electronic acts sprinkled in from, from here from time to time. Um where is it 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 there we go four points east um and for this year they've announced um so there's an article from um, Resident Advisor, London Festival, All Points East, as James Blake, Royce and Murphy to second edition. Um, they're also going to have Peggy Goose. You know, she's going to be fucking everywhere. I'm interested to see again what she does this year. I think I mentioned it previously to somebody else. Um... I think she's done amazing harnessing social media and all that sort of malarkey um, with her obvious talent because that's something that, you know, you didn't really see a lot. That's why I think there was a lot of um, complaints. You remember when um, Maceo Plex and Nina Kravitz had their thing that they were kind of going back and forth on and, you know, Maceo Plex and a few other DJs thought maybe that Nina Kravitz was getting a little bit more luck, a little bit more love on on the press side of things because, you know, she's a drop-dead gorgeous woman um, than they were, right? And I remember that kind of transpired off the back of that resident advisor behind the music or behind the scenes video where Nina Kravitz was in a bath, uh, was in a bubble bath, like it, having an interview, talking and shit, being all sultry and sexy as she always is, um, which I thought was quite funny. And, you know, it was quite cool, to be honest, to kind of see that whole thing. I didn't really get a boner from it or anything. It didn't really challenge my masculinity. But I can see why some male artists probably thought, hey, you know, we're not sexy beasts, so we can't really afford that luxury. Um, but, you know, I'm just, you know, this is the world we live in, you know, social media um, and the internet do allow people to kind of marry up things that necessarily wouldn't necessarily work in other ways, you know, sometimes, you know, um, with festivals and with that sort of like in part, especially in a, a, an occupation like a DJ, um, you know, it is quite visual in that respect, you know, being behind a booth, what you wear, um, the kind of things you do, how you move around behind the booth. And if you if you want to play that game and you are fairly attractive and you, you are a good DJ, it only serves you to kind of harness that and to kind of, you know, quote unquote exploit it for your own benefit and Nina Kravitz has done a good job of it and again she's a great producer great DJ she has an amazing label with great artists on there too um so she's not really the the point of that whole thing but um a lot of people getting uh, annoyed by it and of course when Peggy Yu came out she seemed like another one of those people on that kind of line right a fairly uh a fairly attractive um Asian lady who wears amazing outfits has got great sense of style is um really good on camera really charismatic really charming um funny and shit 
and um and she DJs right and and she plays vinyl for some time for the most part sometimes right so people are like oh this is some like gimmick but then you hear her play and you're like nah she's really good you hear her songs and you're like nah she's really good so um I'm hoping that she's able to build on it next year because you know we've seen with you know the Seth Trucks the thing happened with him he's mentioned a few times how you know the kind of hype um kind of derailed his career for a few bit for a few times um we've kind of seen stuff that's happened with um jack master um he's kind of taken a bit of a hiatus since that thing happened and transpired with him in the festival we've seen it happen with dixon who was voted number one dj three times in the year he kind of said that it kind of maybe got to his head and he had to kind of take a step back and cancel loads of bookings and whatever he, he did to kind of get things back online sometimes that stardom that being put up on a pedestal as a number one person doesn't work for everybody um, not everyone can do it so I'm hoping hoping that she can kind of ride it out and kind of s not slow it down but maybe kind of make it a bit more manageable for herself and kind of put out more music because again like I said like I've been playing that um that song she put out last year for like you know basically the whole year it's one an amazing song and whenever she DJs whenever I see it's mixes of sets of hers I'm always checking them out I think she's probably one of the best on the scene regardless of what you may think of her personally um, and hoping it can continue so that'd be cool to see her in Victoria Park and then um you've also got Maurice Fulton you've got Josie Rebel who i know you got geology you got optimo dmx crew and john hopkins so anyway um the all the, the entire lineup is the one that i want to check out right so you got all points he's here right and put it here on the screen the entire lineup is the one that i want to check out um so friday on the 24th they got the chemical brothers hot chip primal screen john hopkins spiritualized little dragon peggy goo uh royce and murphy danny brown david august lane a little sims blah, blah blah which is quite a cool lineup to overall I could probably skip it if I wanted to, but if I wanted to go see, you know, see the Chemical Brothers play live would be quite cool. Hot Chip, I feel like, you know, I've got a bit of a Hot Chip overload, especially in Leighton Wolverstow. One of the guys who used to be in Hot Chip, or it maybe still is, I'm not too sure, keeps using the name Hot Chip DJ to go DJ places around. I'm, I'm sure people have seen it. Um, there's a guy that's always like using the Hot Chip um, name to kind of get himself bookings around town. So I've kind of got a bit... Um, bored of seeing hot chip in general they were you know they were important to me at, you know at a moment in time the early 2000s when they did come around but i'm not sure if i want to see them now but the other lineups are the one that's interesting on saturday the strokes are playing fucking yeah raconteurs interpol right in this is indie heaven johnny ma pocket courts jarvis cocker uh, Courtney Barry, uh, Conor McCosian, Anna Calvin Bacar, the nude party viagra boys that is an incredible lineup incredible and again, hoping there's not many clashes, but I'd, I'd literally see every single one of them people live, one one by one. And on the Sunday, you got Christine and the Queens, you got James Blake, whose you know new album, Assume Form, is amazing, really, really breathtaking stuff. You can really tell that James Blake is finally in love. He's not talking about heartbreak anymore. Um, he's in a fucking great place. Some of the word plays, some of the songwriting is top notch it'll be great to see him play perform live you got Maribu State you got Kamasi Washington is always kind of a good draw live performance wise Beach House Hoon uh, Kurt Vile and the Violators Princess Nokia was amazing Ezra Collective Tori uh, Tori Umoy great album that came out the other day as well uh, Bob Moses Andrew Everall one of my favourite DJs he used two more someone you know that everyone's kind of like hyping and saying is going to be a good look I think put a mixtape or EP last year I haven't listened to that yet Joy Oberson uh coco uh moxie's playing um octa octa and then the one the second week so it's uh so i think it's two weekends right but not they, they, they didn't um mirror the lineups like um coach did they've got a completely different lineup so the next weekend um they managed to get bring me the horizon who just put out a new for, a new album run the jewels nothing but thieves and idols idols is probably one of my standout bands from last year they're like their album last year um i forgot the name of it what's the album called was so so fucking good man uh let me see here idols what was the album called do, 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 do. uh joy joy as an act of uh of resistance it's fucking amazing really good miss album super heartbreaking the lead singer of, of idols went through a, a couple of um really fucked up situations last year that he kind of spoke on the album and it's a real tearjerker if you listen to the lyrics so i recommend you check it out um amazing 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 live band so uh, they actually performed on um uh what's his name on leo jules holland is it leo jules holland right yeah a, a couple of weeks ago 
no, a few months ago, sorry, that was a really good live performance. I recommend you check that out. And then, um, again, so you got that on Friday, Bring Your Eyes and Run the Jewels, Nothing But Thieves Idols. And then on Sunday the 2nd, you've got Bon Iver, Mac DeMarco, um, First Aid Kit, um, John Grant, and The Tallest Man on Earth. There's been a lot of talk on the forums I've seen about Mac DeMarco needing to take a break. Supposedly, he's performed in some places and he's been getting absolutely smashed out of his face, probably taking too many drugs, drinking too much, so allegedly, and um, just being a little bit crazy. He's always a little bit, in, he's always a little bit, um, what they what, what 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 they call it um im uh improvised what is it called improv when he performs like he's always adding a few little bits and bobs taking a few left and right turns in his performance when he's on stage but supposedly it's gone a little bit too far in the last couple of weeks or last times he performed so everyone's kind of getting a bit nervous for him but and he's another one that loses his vert like he's never not on tour man uh mac demarco like i think every festival lineup that i wanted to go to i've always seen him on a lineup which you know is fucking crazy considering the amount of festivals there are but yeah all point east is meant to be a super good festival everyone kind of talks really highly about it um i think there's actually a, a little small review here on resident advisor they kind of mentioned that they've said it was really good let me see if i can check it out here yeah here it is all point festival in 2018 um ba 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 Victoria, uh, yeah, so it says here, this is a quick review from la of last year. I'll quickly read this out here. Um, what does it say there? So it says here, Victoria Park has been at the center of London's festival lineup. Uh, last autumn, AG AEG presents uh, secure the rights to host events at the East London spot in a deal with Tower Hamlets Council. This forced out London's field day. Okay, cool. And field day's gone somewhere else now. And Lovebox, which is true, uh, which have called the park home for the last 10 years. In the midst of this, Golden Voice, which is owned by AEG and runs Coachella, introduced All Points East. Its corporate, repu its corporate reputation precedes it, and corporate it was. On site, there was almost always a brand logo in your in your eyeline. Brand, brand activation boosts all over the grounds, though it was unclear what any of them involved. Samsung even managed to place an obnoxiously bright viewing booth in a perfect spot to ruin everyone's Instagrams of the lightning storm looming over Bjork's ephemeral closing set. All Points East did little to promote it a personality, but its bookings made a statement. So again, uh, a corporate festival um, may be ben benign by fucking branding everywhere, but you know, the stages, the acts and solves are going to carry it, which is, you know, what you saw in the lineup that I mentioned previously. Uh, da, da, da. All points in the the lineup, which spanned uh, dance, hip hop, indie pop, with electronic thread uh, running throughout, had a strong gender balance. I not I don't really care about that to be honest. I want the best people to perform. I don't care what is between their legs. Um, the most festival similar lineups, headliners, LCD sound system, the XX Bjork made sense next to each other, um, uh, next to each other on the lineup. But the mix of Lord, yeah, yeah, yeah is Bex, Dixon, Justice, Sampha, and Phoenix, and John Father Mercy felt a bit jumbled. If it's still enticing, effort to make everyone happy. The small, but that was the first one again. I mean, you kind of have to come with the big guns the first one, so I wouldn't get too finicky on that. The small type face names proved to be most interesting, including Omar S, Popcorn, uh, Khalil, Honey, Cool Super, Shanti the least yaji and mr g it's, it's interesting you know right they talk about gender balance and then they mention popcorn hmm not the most uh <laughs> he's not i wouldn't say he's mr feminist is he <laughs> but hey what do i know um yeah so that looked really cool so that was last year's festival some couple of pictures from the event in victoria park which i quite think it's a cool site um that's the last love box i went to actually the one in victoria park on um, a couple of love boxes ago um Let's scroll down to the bottom and see what their review said of it overall. There's Bjork performing, beautiful, beautiful woman, great costume or dress. Anyway, um, what does it say? What's the last sentence here? Nah, it doesn't matter. Anyway, all points it looks like a good festival. People want to go. It looks great. Um, it's coming up this year. What's the, what's the dates for all points? It is. 24th to 2nd of June, so a span of across two weekends. Um, most people during the summer, most office work, um, most office places that aren't, um, you know, that aren't up their own asses are usually going to be open to giving people the opportunity to leave the office a bit early um, on a Friday. So if you can go, can book a ticket ahead of time, get 100 quid, it's Victoria Park, you know, you can go there, you can pre drink before. Um, hang out, see a band, see a couple of bands for 100 quid, which is nothing really, considering the Drake tickets that sold out recently were like 110 pounds or something like that, right? Um, or 80, no, I think 80 pounds and up. So um, it's well worth the money if you want to go see those things. Of course, seeing Drake, um, the performance is going to be awesome, but I'm just saying, in terms of general, it's quite cool to go see these people all under one roof. <sighs> So that's the festival talk, isn't it? For the most part, I think um is it all? I think I might be done with festival talk. Let's move on to other 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 talking points here. What else? 
Oh, handbags. Okay, so there's this um interesting article that I saw featured on Heist Nobody, which of course I mentioned before, I'm not really the biggest fan of the website. I think they do, you know, a quite a bad job in terms of some of the articles that they put out there. That's just my opinion. I think they do a bad job. Um, but no, they did a interesting kind of um roundup into, you know, this um trend that I've kind of seen um percolating on the internet of uh men like myself you know some people may question my manhood but i can assure you that i am a man men like myself um wanting to wear um handbags or wearing things that look like handbags and less like satchels and you know personally coming from someone like myself who's got one of these right these um this is my kind of story of handbag hell or handbag heaven i've always been a fan of bags i've always been a fan of having backpacks when i first into the whole streetwear community that was part of my mo right buying really old uh rare supreme backpacks from like you know um the sixth to the 15th edition upwards right because they go for a lot of money nowadays but those are my favorite stuff i love fucking bags i love the japanese look where you kind of get these massive mountaineering bags and you wear them in an urban environment perfect for me but of course as your as your style progresses and you kind of get a bit more into things um your that idea of having two straps over your shoulders the way bags cinch on your jacket the way they kind of pull you back or sometimes the way they make you walk with a bit of a hunch it doesn't really make it doesn't not really the most flattering thing with outfits right for instance like one good example is bomber jackets wearing a backpack with a bomber jacket never looks good in my opinion um crop top jackets don't look good sometimes wearing a long coat with a back backpack doesn't look good backpacks usually only look good with like you know raincoats max uh down kind of like crop down jackets they don't really look good with anything else apart from that so as you start progressing you start to get into other things you start to get into messenger bags maybe um satchels or that malarkey and then when i started working at the cambridge satchel company a few years ago when they had a small pop-up shop in spitfords market um they had a west vivian westwood collaboration satchel which i thought was fucking heaven and for me at the time it was a perfect bag and this is the bag in, in that i'm mentioning right this bag here i've had this for years right so you can see the back here it's kind of smudged um even the the the, the kind of stamp where the sat came with satchel things meant to be is all smudged up it's all smudged up here too where the sun meant to be i had this for years right but i fucking love it because it again it's for me it's the perfect size i can fit all my stuff in it um and again it looks the much better with outfits than anything else i would wear um that would be like a normal sort of backpack sort of stuff and i'm not really fond of carrying um this is the brunettes but i'm not really a fan of carrying like tote bags like this in your hand right these are not they're too small for me i need something i can carry and put over my shoulder um especially with a strap like this it looks amazing so i love it but i'm also aware that for, to most people a bag like this just looks like a handbag because if you put a strap on top of this that's effectively just a handbag right a lady can carry that and you wouldn't bat an eyelid but, you know, as time has progressed and people started getting more into things and side bags are coming to trend and that whole roadman look has kind of evolved, I've kind of seen a lot of people kind of get into the whole actually having a handbag thing. And for me personally, again, this is this is the, the um, going on top of the kind of article that was read up in on High Snob IT. They've kind of made some good points regarding this. Um, so they've kind of mentioned what I've mentioned and this is the uh, uh, article on High Snobiety. It says men want to wear purses. They just don't know yet. We know it, trust me. And they've got this interesting picture on the top, which again, they're both wearing purses. Um, these two kids, at, I think they're at Fashion Week, they're just posing for their street style. One of them has that Isi Miyake handbag that, that loads of girls have, the one with the kind of like, you know, polygon, like triangle things all over it. And the other bag, I'm not too sure what company that is from. But anyway, the article is quite good. It mentions here on the following. I'll read a little bit of it now on screen. Um, Da, 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 got it up on there so it says here the crowds outside menswear shows in paris are always a good hint of what's going on what's going to be a talking industry in months to come i don't necessarily think so i think necessarily the crowds outside the shows are a reflection of what's already happening right and it's not as if like people suddenly oh i'm gonna start wearing that people are really doing this if you go on forums if you go on uh uh our street where if you so if you go on most of the big kind of like um outfit people on instagram who post what they wear most part they're already doing these things before they've already featured on the runway if anything the guys outside the runways are kind of people kind of following trends but still early adopters but you know it's not so um for pushing anyway let's continue last week you saw plenty of great fits but frank ocean and his large green saline bag were a particular show stealer snap aside louis vuitton the sleek leather uh, phoebe fowler design tote contrasted against the singer's casual combo of bright orange puffer and jeans and beanie true that picture of um him wearing the handbag was very interesting because um i think frank ocean's walking what's he walking through i think he's walking through let's see if i can find it i think he's walking i think he's walking um so yeah like i mentioned to louis vuitton show you're walking outside right um let me quickly see if i can get up on here 
Da, 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 da. Frank Ocean, Paris. Celine. So there's this picture of Frank Ocean, yeah, with a handbag that everyone was kind of going goo goo gaga over, right? There we go. Bush, bash, bosh, show that. So there we go, this picture, right? Right there. So that was interesting to me. Number one, of course, because it's, you know, Phoebe Philo, uh, Celine is kind of maybe Frank Ocean saying, you know, bring back Phoebe Philo because everyone's kind of, you know, kicking Heidi Semen in the nuts because they don't like what he's doing. But also, it was a kind of good nod and reminder to me because I remember back in the day when I used to hang out with some of the OG streetwear guys or I used to talk to some of them. I remember that there's this guy called Andrew Bunny who now owns his own uh, jewelry company called uh, Bunny and he's worked with Gimme Five and he's quite like well known in the industry. And um, I remember when I met him once for an interview I had to do for him, like, for I think it might have been hype piece back in the day. Um, I met him up to have a coffee and have an inter sit down interview. I remember he came with a Louis Vuitton back, a Louis Vuitton handbag. You know the women's handbag, um, which is this one, I think. Let me let me try and get it up. He was wearing one of these handbags as like a tote instead of wearing having a tote bag. He had like a handbag, and I thought it looked fucking amazing. I thought it looked really really cool. And ever since then, I've seen someone like Hiroshi Fujiwara wearing it, and a few others, the Japanese alum uh, um, alumni, and it kind of got me thinking. Oh, that would look actually quite good as a for a guy to wear it but then i don't think i was as comfortable to wear it just on the shoulder strap as a handbag i wouldn't mind if they had a if they had like a little strap you could maybe attach it yourself like i go go to like a cobbler or somebody and get them to put like a leather strap on the outside of those bags and the bag that i'm mentioning is this bag right it's from louis vuitton i think it's available you can buy it online um this is the bag that i saw andrew um andrew bunny wearing when i when i met him in a coffee shop uh la, la, la. come on load 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 it's called the uh, Never Fall, right? Never Fall MM. I think monogram print, I'm assuming that is, right? So this is the bag that I saw Andrew Bunny wearing when he came uh, to meet me for a coffee. And this was a guy, right? And I, that's what, I remember this was, this must have been like 2000, maybe 2000 and, 2008 or 2007. I remember making up for this, right? And I thought, fuck, that was really cool. So essentially, it's just like a woman's handbag, right? It, it just is, it just, it is a woman's handbag. But um, he was wearing it like this. And I remember he virtually for Juara had one and he kind of like stenciled the fragment logo on the, on the side with a spray paint, right? Kind of put stencil on it, kind of sprayed it, kind of made it a bit more rugged, maybe a bit more masculine looking. But I thought you could easily maybe take some of the straps or on the inside or some of the strings, they might be attached to it and attach it to the side of it and kind of make it into like a, a kind of satchel, kind of totally thing that you can wear across your body. And it could be as good as anything else you'd see a man wear. And I thought it looked quite interesting, right? So that's what it looks like, blah, 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 blah. And um, so when obviously, of course, Frank Ocean where everyone kind of got, you know, crazy, the handbag, but it makes sense, right? Again, like I mentioned, backpacks only serve a certain purpose and they don't look good with most outfits. And um, handbags, you can just fit more in it. A handbaggy, hatch satchel type thing. You can throw it around. It works with most outfits, as you've seen mo with most women where they wear their handbags. It's rare, especially for the more, more expensive bags. It's rare that a woman will have like three or four Celine's or Hermes bags or Chanel bags, right? They might only have a couple of them, but they wear them with all their outfits because, you know, it's the handbag that kind of steals the show, for instance. So guys are kind of doing the same thing. Um, so that is quite interesting. Uh, anyway, the article continues. Um, uh, it showed how the attitude towards bags and menwear is changing. You don't have to look feminine or overdressed to sport a sizable accessory traditionally associated with women's fashion, which is true. In recent years, bags for men have gone from something almost taboo to one of the hottest trends and big energy players with keen to jump on board, which is true. You know, all over the runway show, menswear especially, especially in Milan, that's the most stodgy, kind of like um, well-to-do, uh, proper place. You saw fucking side bags, menswear bags everywhere, which is quite an interesting job position, right? Considering most of the outfits or most of the collections in milan were quite suit and tailored based but they all had a, a kind of splashing of a satchel or some sort of like waist bag or something right some sort of pockety kind of thing because it seems like again i don't know what it was before but i didn't mind putting stuff in my pockets right? i'd always have my pockets fucking stuffed with shit but it seems like guys don't want to have stuffed pockets everyone wants to look really sleek and well put together i'm not sure what that's about again which again is the evolution of uh, how men put together stuff together and now it's cool oh, it actually mentioned milan here that's cool continues in milan fenny presented uh men's versions of the label signature bugatti and peekaboo bags and a collaboration with japanese luggage expert porter again which is the quintessential you know um uh maker of bags that of men that from various ranges from backpacks to saddle bags to messenger bags they will make them all of it a hybrid of a side bag and handbag in red blue and camouflage nylon um at kim john's dior show um almost every outfit was accompanied by a compliment by a bag a crossbody uh, versions of the dior saddle bag 
um, with the Bako Mebra leaks. Uh, the, the, you have here, bag here, like kind of, again, like a bit of a handbag at Prada. Meanwhile, there were already comfortable black nylon backpacks and Luebe had sleek crocodile clutch bags, large leather totes and variations of the label's hit puzzle bag. For full winter 2009, 2019, um, almost every ever major house had an updated it bag um, of there as thoroughly as Virgil Abloh. In less than a year at Louis Vuitton, he has given us numerous versions of the Keppel, a glow-in-the-dark, iridescent, semi-transparent, neon pink, yellow, soft grey, oversized black. That's what he's won in that range, isn't he? Embossed in puffer material. This season also gave us a medium and large purse, like a mini version of Louis Vuitton signature retro travel trunks. Historically, men and bags have been complicated relationships. Google the two words together. I bag says blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, We've had a questionable relationship. Again, there's this guy wearing this bag that looks fucking incredible, right? That's a great, great look. So, again, you're seeing the evolution of it coming year in, year out. And, again, I only can speak for myself. Like, I don't like to wear backpacks all the time. I like the kind of satchel bag that's happening. I kind of like the trend that I'm seeing nowadays. I think since the Frank Ocean thing has popped up, and, again, since I mentioned, I've always had the kind of idea of having that kind of tote. So, I'd, much, I'd be much more... I'd be more than happy to kind of pick up a fucking bootleg of the um, Louis Vuitton Never Fall. Because I think the retail is what? The retail is ba, 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 920 pounds. I'm not paying that. So I'm happy to pay for like a fucking bootleg from, I don't know, Dawson Market or something and just get the strap attached to it over the top and use that as a sort of bag to wear. Again, you could easily just spray paint names on the side of it or make it a little bit, you know, graffiti up a bit um, similar to uh, what's the collaboration? Is it Steven Sprouse with um, Lou, Mark Jacobs and Louis Vuitton? That was quite a um, covetable collection. And again, you're going to see a lot of it happening in the new seasons happening more so coming up. And again, thanks streetwear, man. For all these fashion critics that want to say, take Lewin's bag, get the streetwear guys out. They're taking all our stuff, right? All the stuff that kind of makes us who we are, right? The things that we're, we're, we were always the ones that were cool wearing fucking side bags. Now you're seeing all these other fashion Easter guys wearing side bags, right? And all these fashion critics want to say tailoring's back to get us out of, the, out of the room and look what they want. They want to take our little accessories. It's not going to happen, not under my watch. <laughs> but yeah, only joking. Anyway, um, that is accessory an hour. I've kind of already um, extruded some bogey out my nose. It's a good time to go. I've got to head off to work now. Thank you so much for tuning in to X Nosing Show episode number 150. It's been a good one, hasn't it? Right? It's been a good one. Short, sharp, concise, loads of talk about festivals, loads of talk about fashions and all that sort of malarkey. So hope you're happy with that. I will see you guys again on the other side tomorrow for another bang 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 episode of content. And until then, until then, be safe, um, be wise, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Peace out.